We'd like to give you an opportunity to worship God this morning with your finances by giving back a portion of what God has entrusted to you. Tithing is an act of worship, and as followers of Jesus, tithing is an act of worship that we are called to do. Tithes allow us, as a church, to reach out and connect people to Jesus. So to give this morning, you can go and visit thegatheringottawa.com slash giving. Thank you for giving. Hello everyone, welcome to The Gathering Online. We exist to connect people to the love of Jesus and we're glad you are a part of our online church family. You're in for a wonderful treat today because our lead pastor Jeff and friend of The Gathering, Renewal Church's lead pastor Josh, are swapping for the day. Jeff's speaking at Renewal and Josh is speaking here. Now, if there's one thing I can tell you about Josh, it's that he's the smiliest guy I've ever met and I love it when I get to cross paths with him. So you're all in for a treat today. Today, Josh is talking about Jesus' disruptive presence. In John 8, we are presented with a messy scene. It's a tale of how religion can be wrongfully wielded to harm others rather than setting them free. A woman stands humiliated in full display before the crowd, and the religious accusers are setting a trap for Jesus. The angry crowd have stones in hand ready to execute her judgment, but others learn to drop the stone in light of Jesus. Are you on the edge of your seat? Josh will be here momentarily to tell you more, but first, let me read the passage for today, which is John 8, verses 1 to 11. A woman caught in adultery. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, what a great story. Go and sin no more. He is not condemning us. It's amazing. It's amazing. Thank you for the opportunity to read that scripture this morning. And I pray that you will speak through Josh as he comes right now. With whatever you have laid on his heart, I pray that you would just really be impact, impactful on us this morning, and that we would really hear what you want us to hear. Go and sin no more. Mm. Help us to do that. Be with us, be present. Speak to us this morning, and help us to make the moves in our lives that you are calling us to move right now. Perhaps there's one thing in particular that you're wanting to speak to us right now, to speak into our hearts, I pray that you would just do that. I pray that you would help us to open up our hearts and our minds so that we can receive that from you this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you do for us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Have a great new week, everyone. I miss you. See you soon. Well, good morning, sisters and brothers. It's always a gift to be with you. You're such a warm community. I can always sense that each time I'm here. Uh, If you are anything like me, you're probably uh, completely disinterested in the Oscars. Um, For whatever reason, I get really cynical about events like that. Uh, They've been called festivals of meaninglessness. I'm like, yeah, I agree completely. But however I feel about the Oscars, I can't deny that many, many people are enamored with them and and love the pageantry and and, uh, everything is about it the awards that are distributed. But all of these beautiful things, the pageantry, the the awards, this year they were overshadowed uh, by the actions of Will Smith, if you recall. Chris Rock was the host of this event, and one of the key aspects of being a host is to roast the people in attendance. And so if you are in attendance at the Oscar, it's generally fair game. Uh, You kind of sit there uncomfortably, Uh, wondering if the host is going to make a jab at you. And in an unscripted moment, 
Chris Rock, ad lib a joke about Jada Pinkett Smith, Will Smith's wife. And given the nature of her medical condition, the joke was interpreted as cruel. Uh, so Will gets up from the front rows and he approaches the stage. And then he winds up and he hits Chris Rock with a haymaker. This is uh, every public speaker's nightmare, right? Uh, and, and so he winds up and, and, and he hits him with a haymaker and sits down and he warns him to never speak about his wife again. And as well as sitting, there, he's quivering in anger. His breath is quivering. He's just shaking. And the crowd is hushed in this awkward moment of harsh violence and anger. And so the next day, Twitter is ablaze. Uh, and news all over social media and every internet community is now posting memes of Will Smith. Um, and, and, you know, my son is coming back from school talking about, then he will smith them. And, and it becomes this verb, right? Uh, I grew up watching Will Smith. I, I grew up on Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Everything I knew about how to interact with people was from that show. <laughs> um, and, and months ago, when his memoir released, I picked it up on the day of release. Uh, so I read that memoir. I know parts of his story. But I'm certainly not going to defend Will's actions. They were wrong, full stop, period. But because of his actions, I couldn't help but recall parts of the story that I had read, parts of his difficult childhood. He wrote at length about the torment that he experienced watching his father habitually physically abuse his mother. At nine years old, he watched his father hit her so hard that she collapsed and she was spitting blood. Something like that does something to you when you're nine years old. And he recalls just how helpless he felt as a young boy being unable to protect his mom. It played in his mind over and over again. And that moment remains his biggest regret. No accolade, no box office record, nothing that he accomplished ever eased that regret. And while Will was wrong in his actions, there's no doubt there. Knowing Will's story, I couldn't help but see the humanity of Will in that moment. In that moment, he was this nine-year-old boy. He was a nine-year-old child again. Trauma doesn't give anyone a free pass to harm others, but his actions came out from his wounding. He wanted to protect his wife. And we get stuck in these patterns, don't we, from trauma in our childhood. The next day, Will, or more likely his PR team, issued an apology, and the last sentence read, quote, I am a work in progress. End quote. Now, I had this incident in my mind. The Oscars were fresh in my mind when I was originally preparing this message. And it had reoccurred to me that Jesus in the Gospels saw people as, he tr as they truly were. He saw the people that he encountered. Jesus knew the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. And he here and now, he sees you. He sees me. He sees everything uh, that, that people aren't always privileged or invited to see in our lives. Right? Jesus can see past our appearances. He sees past the show. He understands and he brings wholeness wherever we find ourselves. And while everyone can see our actions, everyone can judge us, and everyone can uh, form their own opinions based on how they perceive us, Jesus sees the full iceberg beneath the surface. Mm. Jesus can empathize with our weakness. And Jesus shows us a better way. And so today we're reading the story of a woman who's caught in the act of adultery. In the act. But this woman's story is also known by Jesus. And her life is forever changed by him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we engage with this precious passage of Scripture, may you draw us to the person of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, would you cultivate within us more of the character of Christ-likeness to be more Christ-like in our character, in our posture, and in the way that we see and interact with the people around us. 
Holy Spirit, would you have your way with us? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So first off, I always wondered in this story, where is the man? Where is the man? And if you've read this story several, several times, and this has not occurred to you to ask this question, why is that? Why is that? Where is the man? If, if a woman is caught in the act of adultery, usually it takes two to tango, right? Where is the partner in them? Where, why did the teachers of the law and the Pharisees not drag out the man as well? In the Torah, in the Jewish law, um, the, in Leviticus chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 22, I believe it's on the following slide, it's specific that if people are caught in the act of adultery, the man must be stoned as well. And unfortunately, in this story, we don't really get a clear answer about where the man is. We can only speculate. So more on that later. But what we do know is that women were very, very vulnerable in the ancient Near East. So beginning at verse 1 on the next slide, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives. But early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. This is the first verse of this passage, setting a bit of the context. Uh, but Jesus, this opening sentence is often lost on a modern reader, but it's of great significance to the Hebrew listener. Jesus is making his way from the Mount of Olives to the temple. So on the following slide, it'll, it'll give you a little bit of a, a diagram here to give you an idea. Yes, that one. This Jesus is making his way from the Mount of Olives to the temple. And in the ancient Near East, geography uh, mattered. Geographic locations were rich in meaning. So to travel from the Mount of Olives to the temple, Jesus was moving from the east down, down to the Kidron Valley up to the temple. Now the Hebrew audience would have remembered this major theme in the scripture. Uh, Hebrew, the Jewish people were immersed in the scriptures. They memorized the Torah by age 12. And then they're memorizing historical books and wisdom literature by age 18. They are immersed in the scriptures. And so Exodus chapter 25, we see God is instructing Moses to build this sanctuary so that God may dwell among them. And God's glory and dwelling with his people was designated by the term Shekinah. God's Shekinah glory was dwelling. It means indwelling. And so from cloud to tabernacle to temple, uh, God's presence would dwell with his people for centuries. But the story about in the Hebrew Bible is about how time and time again, religious authorities would cheat people. Uh, we see false exchange rates at the temple. We see religious people abusing that power and that authority to actually oppress others. There were false weights that were used in the scales. The Israelites would oppress their workers on the Sabbath. They would ignore those who were in need. And there was widespread corruption, and it angered the Hebrew prophets, like Isaiah, like Jeremiah, like Ezekiel, like Amos. And so much so that over the course of three chapters in the book of Ezekiel, the glory, the Shekinah presence of God, begins to move away from the temple. The glory of God was moving away from the Holy of Holies to the entrance of the temple to the courtyard. As you see in the next uh, few slides, it moves away from the Holy of Holies, away from the entrance of the temple, away from the courtyard, and then to the east gate in verse 19. And these east gates are also referenced by the psalmist as uh, the gate of the Lord or everlasting doors. And in the next chapter of Ezekiel, we'll see that the glory of God leaves the temple through the east gate. It proceeds to the mountain on the east side of Jerusalem, which is the Mount of Olives. It's the Mount of Olives, after which the glory of God ascends to heaven. And so the corruption became so bad and the Hebrew prophets were warning over and over again about this corruption by religious authorities that the glory, the Shekinah presence of God rises up, leaves the temple, and moves to the east to the Mount of Olives, and it ascends. And so to put it simply, in this one verse, the Hebrew listeners would see that Yahweh's Shekinah presence 
was dwelling with his people in the Hebrew Bible, was leaving due to the corruption of the temple, and now uh, the path is being reversed by Jesus. See that? The path is being reversed by Jesus. This is, it gives me goosebumps. I have goosebumps right now under my jacket. Right? The journey of Yahweh is taking place back to the temple in Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? That's one verse. Right? Jesus goes into the temple. The glory of the Lord, the glory of Yahweh, is returning now to that place, making it holy again. This one verse is argued by scholars to be the interpretive key to this whole story. But when we read this verse, we just like glaze over it. But it has so much depth and richness to it. We can overlook it, but from the biblical audience, this was the lens through which they interpreted this whole passage. This is what gives that passage so much profound meaning. It shows us how revolutionary everything that Jesus did and said was. And if we can appreciate this story through that lens, that's why it took so much time on just one verse. If we can appreciate the story through that lens, it provides us a contrast between the corruption of the people of God, the temple, why the glory left in the first place, and then the intended purpose, what happens when God's glory returns in His presence. So keep all of that in mind as we continue. That was verse 3. Verse 3. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. So first off, caught in the act of adultery. It makes you wonder, where were the Pharisees? Where were the Pharisees? What, what were they doing? They're always trying to trap Jesus. What were they doing? They must have been carefully looking for someone to blame. I imagine they may have even stopped her. Right? But men like the Pharisees could get away with anything. They saw her with another man, knowing what actions might follow. And they leveraged their religious power for the persecution of the vulnerable, the outsider. And they dragged the woman. They dragged the woman out. This is probably a big clue why the man is not present as well. Right? Why isn't he dragged out? This abuse of power is precisely what the Hebrew prophets were angry about. Like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, they all spoke against this. And the Gospel records that they brought this woman out in the public square. Could you imagine anything more humiliating than this? Being caught in the act of adultery. She was socially weak. She was likely not clothed, naked in front of this crowd. She's socially weak. No one will advocate for her. This is a traumatic event. She's caught in the act of adultery. Incredibly cruel. But in the minds of the accusers, they're not in the wrong because they're theological policemen. Okay. They're theological policemen. Moses told us what to do, and we're just reinforcing it. Theological policing still happens today, doesn't it? Moses told us what to do. We're enforcing it. And so they've got this woman publicly humiliated with her knees on her neck, figuratively. Speaking of this passage, David Fitch, he says, quote, Instead of a sign of new life for the world, the law, the Torah, is used to pit one group of people against another to define who is in and who is out. And this had become a major sticking point for Jesus. The law given to Israel to give witness to God and His purposes in the world had become an ideology that separated who is in from who is out. Israel had become self-righteous. End quote. And in Jesus, we're now seeing that the proper purpose of Torah to bless all people, to draw people to God, to draw the best out of us, bringing God and people together. In verse 5, it says, The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Here the Pharisees revealed their cards. This was the plan all along. This is what was happening under the surface. They set a trap for Jesus. Jesus was caught in this trap. And Jesus has two clear options. This is why it's a trap. Option number one. Jesus can agree with Moses' law and proceed to stone her. 
they would immediately put Jesus on blast because he proclaims liberation, peace, and forgiveness. If he had done option number one, he is hypocritically ordering her to her death. Option number two, Jesus can release her. And this is a trap. Because if he releases her, the Pharisees can say, saying, you are disobeying Torah. The theological priest may come in and get Jesus in trouble. So will Jesus yield to their religious power and authority, which is option number one, or will Jesus go against the law of Moses? Option number two. Both of which seem terrible, don't they? Generally, this would stump rabbis in that day. And it did stump rabbis in that day. But not Jesus. Not Jesus. Part of the purpose of the Torah was to become more aware of the ways in which we miss the mark. The ways in which we fall short of what God has intended and how God has called us to live. And yet here they're pointing out to others their sins and shortcomings. They're using the law to separate. It's why there's often a sick pleasure in gossip, isn't there, in watching others fail. Shelley and I have a guilty pleasure of watching one particular reality show. And that reality show is very popular and it just released. And tons of people have been messaging me always, what do you think of this? What do you and I, like, I feel this conviction about it because I find that the entertainment in reality shows is just you're your being entertained in gossip. That's what it is. The entertainment is judgment itself, isn't it? They're using their knowledge of God's law to hurt people rather than to liberate them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees were wielding power and knowledge in ways to control and abuse others. And John is showcasing the corruption of the temple, the law, the religious power. Jesus himself flips tables at the temple. There's this account of the adulterous woman. There's the account of Jesus healing a blind man and rather celebrating, rather than celebrating the healing of this blind man, they're theologically pleasing Jesus. Remember that? Religion becomes weaponized against people in order to further exclude and push them away. And everything that made God's Shekinah presence leave and exit the way of the Mount of Olives, now Yahweh is making his way back to the temple. He is the Word made flesh. And now we're meant to watch Jesus. And so, the way of Jesus, we're meant to see in Jesus what the glory of God looks like, what God's Shekinah glory looks like. Verse 6. They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his face. This is the only time uh, Jesus is recording writing, physically writing, in the gospel. And St. Augustine of Hippo, he speculated that Jesus was writing the sins of those who were blaming the woman. And we don't know for sure. I thought that was just really pretty neat. New Testament professor Chris Keith, he writes that as Jesus was writing in the sand, it parallels the actions of God himself, thus making Jesus superior to Moses. Jesus, who is God, is writing a new and better way. I guess you folks, right? Jesus, who is God, is writing a new and better way. Jesus fulfills the law. Moses broke the first tablet, which necessitates God writing a new one. I think of Jesus a few chapters later saying, I give you a new command, love one another as I have loved you. End quote. Isn't that so beautiful? God broke those tablets. God broke those tablets. God needs to write a new one. does so in the person of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned Throw the first stone. I have to tell you, that is a disruptive one. That is a disruptive one. See, the accusers are using the Torah to bring judgment and exclusion on somebody else. And Jesus is inviting all those who are ready to stone this woman to see themselves in that moment. Jesus is putting a mirror up to every single person. 
Jesus takes the vengeance of the crowd and he puts it squarely back in the hands of God to whom it belongs. Right? In the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus says the standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. I feel like this is one of those things that Jesus does that we conveniently forget about millions of times every day. And Jesus says, and why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? Well, like, oh, Jesus is talking about someone else. He's talking, right? He's like, how often we sit in a sermon and we're like, I wish this person was here to hear this. It's about you. <laughs> it's about me. Right? And the ideological violence fritters away as one by one the accusers start to disperse. The woman is left in the presence of Jesus and Jesus alone. And she's cleared of all the strife and the violence and the anger. Jesus shows that a gift of Torah is to humble us. To show us that each of us misses that standard. Each of us misses that mark. Scripture continues in verse 8. Then Jesus stooped down again and wrote in the dust. And the accusers heard this. They flipped away one by one. Beginning with the oldest, isn't that interesting, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. See, the law of Moses states that both the adulteress and the adulterer should be put to death. The curious absence of the male offending party, to me, that's the biggest evidence to show that these religious theological policemen don't even care about the law. They don't even care about the law. They were setting a trap for Jesus. If they cared about the law like they claim, they would have dragged out the man as well, wouldn't they? Right? It's not about the law. They just have a personal vendetta against Jesus, a prophet, a truth teller. They don't care about upholding the law. How often does that happen in people that use religiosity to control others? This woman knew that she was dead. Her accusers had her hemmed in. There was no escape. Her sin defined her and it condemned her. But Jesus didn't shame her. Jesus didn't condemn her. Jesus didn't throw a stone. Jesus was able to see past her sin. Jesus was able to see her. Jesus was able to see her and his heart was moved with compassion. Scripture records that Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. And I like to imagine that part of the reason that Jesus did this was to draw attention away from this humiliated woman who's standing naked before her accusers and to draw the attention on himself. He deflected the negative attention from the crowd, the judgment of the crowd from this traumatized woman, and he drew that attention to himself. And all we know is that the atmosphere that was created by Jesus' presence, Jesus' word, Jesus' um, everything about him, all we know is that his presence disarmed these people. It disrupted them, and it disarmed them. The light of God actually drove away the darkness of their sinful judgment. Verse 10, Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin with no one. Jesus encounters this woman where she was in her journey, which was in his rock bottom. And he didn't leave her that way. He didn't leave her that way. Jesus sets her free at the temple. God's Shekinah glory returns to the temple and accepts her free. Because that's what God does. That's what God does. Right? The temple was always meant to be a place where the sin of people, humankind, were forgiven and people can encounter God himself and receive grace upon grace. And now God's Shekinah presence returns to the temple in the person of Jesus Christ and she is set free. Is not condemned by the only one who could condemn her, by the way. The only one who could throw a stone didn't throw a stone. 
And as the New Testament progresses, we see that the whole earth is the temple. The whole earth is the temple. What's powerful is that you and I can likely see ourselves in the story, in all these different characters, right? Each of us can see from these perspectives, in, in a very real way, each of us are also the adulterous woman. Right? A shameful path. Feeling alone. Feeling like it can't be authentic and vulnerable with one another because what if they knew the real me? What if they knew the real me? But then the one who truly has the right to condemn you can look at you and see the real you and set you free and say, go to the Lord. Right? We can also see from the perspective of the accusers because let's face it, all of us have been the accusers. Right? You and I can be harsher judges than God himself. How often do we pound our gavels when we see a news story that breaks, but we never even heard their story or know the people involved? How often do we condemn people to life sentences without parole while God is saying, wait, I love this woman. There's hope for him. I love this man. There's hope for him. We can be saved. Jesus gives this woman uh, more than just her life. He did save her life. Jesus, in a very literal sense, saved her life. But he gave her a future. So he gave her more than life. He gave her a future. One in which, where she's called to live holy, set apart. Right? For the reality which Jesus that Jesus gives to her, that future, he gives to us. He gives to you and I. We don't need to be trapped in that shameful path. We can be set free and we can honor God with our lives. And we can honor God with the way in which we approach people who have been accused. We can honor God with that same compassion, that same grace. You and I can see into the hearts of both the accused and the accuser because we've been both. Can, and, and God can see into our hearts, right? He can see that mix of good and evil. The teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees condemned this woman until Jesus' disruptive remarks brought awareness to the fact that each one of them has missed the mark as well. We don't know what Jesus is writing in the sand, but we do know that everything disrupted them. And one by one, oldest to youngest, they started dropping their stuff. This is one of these stories in, in the scriptures that kind of shaped my life philosophy. And I wish I could see this play out. Because whatever Jesus did, he created this atmosphere of grace. And it disarmed people who were judging and ready to kill others. And that same presence of Jesus Christ, like the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, lives and dwells in you. Right? So God's Spirit may you allow the Spirit to do that same transformation in your own heart. You think of someone that you're judging in this moment, and the Spirit is inviting you to release that spell. Because you have also been in the center of that same circle. Where people were willing to throw stone at you. Have there been times in, in, in your awareness and shortcomings where, because you became more aware of your own shortcomings, God has helped you extend grace to the people around you. Right? The law of Moses says to stone her, what do you say? Right? Jesus had the courage to respond and extend grace in such a way um, that would anger the religious leaders. But it freed this woman. Right? We are invited to be a people who create atmospheres of grace for the people around us. When people gang up on a colleague, perhaps you can step in. Right? When people gang up unjustly upon people, we are called to demonstrate that it's compassion. Right? But Jesus' presence didn't just leave her that way. It changed her. We don't know the rest of the story, but she, and then oftentimes in the gospel, when Jesus does this to people, we don't know the full rest of the story, but their lives will never be the same again. So the, oops, sorry. so the invitation today 
if you read scripture through that lens, that, that lens that God's glory is returning into the temple in the person of Jesus Christ, that changes everything. And God is showing us the way in which the people of God are to live as a habit. Grace upon grace upon grace. And grace doesn't condone sin. Jesus says, go and sin no more. Because grace transforms. Grace transforms. So let's invite the Holy Spirit to work in each of our hearts. Grace. Let's pray. God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we know that you examine our hearts. And that God, when you test our hearts, that word in the Hebrew Scripture is actually to draw out impurity in our life like a refiner refines gold. Drawing the impurities to the top only to skim that away and to change our character. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you to do that same thing to our lives today. We invite you to examine us, to test us, to see into our hearts, and to draw all of those impurities, the ways in which we judge others, the ways in which we attempt to take the place of a judge. Draw that to the surface that your Spirit can remove those impurities and produce Christ-likeness in our own lives so that we would be the hands and feet and the mouthpiece of Jesus in our spirits and in the We pray for the grace of a pure heart. Spirit, have your way with our character. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
All I want is all 